Welcome back to Omics Logic Data Science. Let us now review some of the Omics data types used in biomedical research. A lot of the data we will talk about in this session is unstructured, and therefore it has to be processed before it is made useful for analysis or machine learning. Some of the data types used in biomedical research you might be well familiar with, types of patients, disease stages, or drug response. But others, you might be learning some new things for the first time, such as genomics or metagenomics. Collectively, these data types are known as omics data. Each type can be generated using a similar technique, but there will be many differences in how we can prepare each one of these data types and structure it for analysis. Let's start from the beginning. What is data science? Data science relies on information technologies and analytical methods to extract meaning from data. In the case of biological data, that can include basic research, biotechnology, biomedicine, genomics, agriculture, and many other domains. In this video, we will start reviewing some of these basic properties of biological data. As the data itself is changing, and what do these changes mean for the analytical techniques and the skills one needs to have to deal with such data effectively? Data science involves developing methods of recording, storing, and analyzing data to effectively extract useful information, practical information, actionable information. The goal of data science is to gain insights and knowledge from any type of data, both structured and unstructured. But the majority of data is unstructured, and therefore it has to be processed before we can analyze it to make it useful. So what is structured and unstructured data? Unstructured data can include images, emails, reviews, maybe sounds or speech the way it naturally comes out. To structure it, first, many times we try to force structure. For example, we can provide categories that we know are useful. Maybe these are folders that you can organize your data in, hashtags like we see on Twitter. But structured data, ideally, is something that is easy to analyze, and most analysis methods work on numeric data. So to illustrate the concept of unstructured data, let us try to conduct a survey. If I ask you, what is your educational background? You might respond in many different ways. For example, I'm studying biochemistry, I have a degree in computer science, I have a bachelor's in biotechnology, or I'm a graduate student. So instead, we tend to structure surveys, replacing the actual information that somebody would share with a code for a category that we know how to analyze. As a result, you can see bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, or faculty. Now, if I ask the question in such a way, a lot of the depth of the information that you might be willing to share is now missing. So as a result of us trying to scale up this process and simplify the collection of data to analysis of data for actionable insights, we are depending on efficient ways to process data. So for example, when we are collecting this data and it looks like this, we might have to perform a number of processing steps to actually turn data into something that we can analyze and even visualize so that many people can look at it and intuitively understand. The same would be true for any kind of data but especially big data. Big data has certain characteristics that we have to keep in mind, velocity, variability, and volume. To make sense of such data, we need to process it and prepare it for analysis, linking elements, reducing noise, and making sure that we have the right kind of information that could be analyzed. In the case of biomedicine, big data is generated across research, clinical practice, and biotechnology industry. In research, there is a growing trend for automating high-throughput data collection, such as omics. In the clinical domain, this includes genotyping, imaging, patient records, and insurance data. And in biotechnology, advances in high-throughput drug screening, real-world patient response monitoring, and mathematical models of epidemiological or individual patient patterns are all resulting in growing data needs and technical challenges. As a result of being able to deal with these challenges and learn how to process data, researchers, clinicians, and industry are making novel discoveries that include new treatments, diagnostic assays, and design strategies for experimentation. 
To take a look at what kind of data is out there, we can just simply look at some of these publicly available data repositories. One of them is called the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI, which has a collection of peer-reviewed articles, biological data sets organized into bio projects that cover a variety of topics. Observing these repositories, we can find that the number of data sets in them is growing exponentially but also variability of data types continues to expand due to new technologies that are emerging and are being adopted by a growing number of labs and researchers. So as a result, each data set has to be approached with a series of steps that include processing, exploratory analysis, and model selection for inference. Due to the volume, variability, and velocity of data, many of these steps have to be automated. That introduces a component of algorithm-based analysis, which is essentially a big part of machine learning. Now let's take a moment to review several different types of omics data and think about what are the steps that are needed to structure this data for analysis and how can this analysis reveal important information that is actionable. Omics data can include phenomics, genomics, epigenomics, and metagenomics. Omics technologies like next generation sequencing can be used to explore the roles, relationships, and actions of the various types of molecules that make up the cells of an organism. Many types of omics data can be generated with the same technique, and the data can show specific information about variants, patterns of gene expression, or maybe microbes that are present in a sample. To structure omics data, we need to take raw sequencing, which are strings of letters, T, C, G, and A, and generate a dataset or a matrix of continuous and categorical data that then can be analyzed. To do that, we organize processing steps in sequences that we will refer to as pipelines because one process takes the output of the previous step and prepares it for the next step. And so it's like water flowing in a pipe. Pipelines are specific to each type of omics data with specific inputs and outputs. For example, genomic data. With shotgun sequencing, genomic data generates short reads of sequences, T, C, G, and A sequences, from randomly selected fragments of DNA. These fragments have to be aligned to the reference genome. Once aligned, one short read can be analyzed for matches and non-matches to the reference sequence. In oncology, the non-matches are analyzed for their mutational status. In many cases, somatic mutations are called to understand how they might affect important genes involved in tumor growth and disease progression. To analyze such data, we can prepare a table of somatic scores for each genome position, where we have a DNA position and a somatic score that reveals the important positions to pay attention to. As a result, we can compile a smaller file of just variants or VCF, variant call file. Such a file can be visualized by annotating the positions that we identified as important with positions of genes and mutations that have been stored in a database. So for example, here you can see a comparison of mutations in an important gene called P53 according to different types of tumors grades of tumors, as well as risk factors. To achieve such results, we have to take raw data or FASTQ files with short reads, run a pipeline for variant calling, and get an output of tables or VCF files. The pipeline might include several pre-processing, mapping, and somatic variant calling steps to ultimately produce the table that we can then analyze for statistical significance of found variants. To learn more about such analysis of genomic data, you can review additional detailed tutorials included in the genomics course, where you will see the basic concepts and principles of genomics, explore genomic data analysis, processing, single nucleotide variation, as well as all the way to variant detection and interpretation. Another example is transcriptomic data. Such data represents mRNA expression, which is a good way to analyze what processes are going on inside the cell by observing active transcription of protein coding genes. DNA is transcribed to RNA, and RNA is translated into protein, which defines the phenotype of a cell. 
But protein coding genes in genomic DNA contain large stretches of non coding sequences called introns that are spliced out of the RNA transcript by an enzymatic complex called the spliceosome before it is passed to the ribosome for translation. The parts of the gene that remain in the mature processed mRNA transcript are called exons. These are the parts that encode the amino acid sequences used for protein translation by the ribosome. A typical analysis pipeline for RNA-seq data allows us to map reads to the reference genome to understand how genes are expressed and what variation in alternative splicing leads to transcripts that ultimately define the phenotype. This pipeline can include pre-processing, mapping, quantification, and differential gene expression steps. As a result, you might obtain a table of continuous numeric data annotated by gene ID and organized consistently across samples in a given experiment with a level of expression in each cell. The full process of RNA-seq data analysis can be separated into several analysis steps for processing, exploratory analysis, hypothesis testing, and interpretation. To learn much more about transcriptomic data analysis and each one of the steps, like pre-processing, mapping, quantification, and differential analysis, you can take the transcriptomics course that we have on the portal. There you will also learn about specific challenges for RNA-seq data analysis in small sample datasets and large-scale studies where machine learning is used for data mining, visualization, and classification of patients. Another type of data that we will review in this course come from the same sequencing technique, but provides us with a completely different view of a biological sample. In this case, we're talking about metagenomics, where we are looking at a sample that contains millions of microorganisms represented by genomes that are very different from each other. To structure this data and organize genomic information into categories, we can take a functionally related gene that is common to all of the organisms that we're looking for. For example, they have a shared function like the ribosome, which can be compared to a database of known sequences that has already been annotated. Now we need to denoise the sequence data and then map those sequences of found specific genes, the 16S ribosomal RNA genes, to a database to classify found sequences into closely related taxonomic groups. This is commonly referred to as 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon data analysis that can be done on the tBioInfo platform using the Data2 pipeline. As a result, you will obtain a proportion of taxonomic groups across samples with analysis of sample diversity or proportionate abundance of specific microorganisms that might be linked to phenotypic variation. The basic type of structured data in this case is also called a table of OTUs or operational taxonomic units across samples with proportionate abundance in each cell. In addition, each OTU can be linked to taxonomic groups by kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, or species. To learn more about such analysis and see several use cases of microbial sequencing in clinical or environmental projects, you can take the metagenomics course that we have on the portal.